Hey pals, this is the last of our summer rerun series, and you knew we were going to have some fun last week. You knew that we were going to bring back up the dolls. But you know what? We are going to take at least one week serious. This week's summer rerun is God's Work. This is an amazing episode of Vice that we all thoroughly love. It's not the most Miami Vice episode, but it is politically and topically important both in the late 80s and today. John goes deep in the music has some words of advice for Book of Love. Melissa is happy to see Castillo happy happy even if it's only for a few minutes it's an episode of miami vice that harkens back to season one and we love it hello and welcome to go with the heat i'm dominic and i'm john i'm melissa and this is your cultural guy it's a phenomenon that was miami vice this week we're talking about season four episode six titled god's work it originally premiered on november 6 1987 it is written by edward Tyven, Tyven, and it's the only episode this person ever wrote and there's no really no information out there about this person the director though is jan eliasberg who we've seen before in forgive us our debts and contempt of court so you know it's just saying. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Before we get started, I can check each other's lives, guys. There's this new Disney streaming service that's being bandied about. Disney's already mentioned that they're going to have this. They're going to be like a Netflix style. They've oriented towards family, so they're not going to have like adult themed stuff. No porn on the Disney streaming is what I'm saying. <laughs> oh. Breathe a sigh of relief for that one. <laughs> <laughs> some of the news is trickling out about what the originals would be on the streaming service. Now I'm going to name some names for you guys of shows that are either going to reboot or do shows around. First, they're already in talks to reboot the Muppets, but not the original Muppets. The Muppets ABC fake reality show oh, that got canceled okay. just a couple of years ago. Okay. But here is the 80s podcast. This is the section you guys might be interested in. Father of the Bride, The Mighty Ducks. The Parent Trap, and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. So I know that may not be 80s, might be early 90s. Okay. A lot about that stuff. You but... can't touch Father of the Bride. Like, don't try and make anything <laughs> around that. It doesn't, it's not going to have Steve yeah, Martin. Hasn't, yet, the so it's, it's hasn't the Parent Trap been done like, like three times? Ending. Yeah, because that's what Lindsay Lohan was in. And then there's obviously the original with, I don't know those pe- those women's names, but they're the twins. And it's like she plays twins, but yeah, um, like was made in what the, the 50s or 60s. Why would you even do that? Why? Mm-hmm. Why do we need another parent trap? So how how on my so if you guys have a problem with those ones, I'm gonna I'm gonna say the, I have the problem with the Mighty Ducks. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm not gonna care about the Mighty Ducks unless it's gonna it's gonna have Joshua Jackson in it. <laughs> I can never <laughs> replace Emilio. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> I was more worried about Pacey. Was Pacey going to be in it? He's in the original. And then also, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Like, is that a TV show? A miniseries? Okay, but they know? already made a TV show out of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and it was on the Disney Channel in right after the movies. Mm-hmm. It was a long-running show. So and that's... also, Rick Moranis fell off the face of the earth oh, no, in, in like the mid-90s. <laughs> And so you wonder if he's going to make a comeback for this. Now, he's fallen off because he decided to dedicate his life to family after his wife passed away. Oh, I but, didn't know that. And, that, and that's why Rick Moranis disappeared. But on my questioning, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, but the world kind of needs Rick Moranis right now. <laughs> yeah, that's one I'm not questioning because they already made one of those. So that's not that far off. One thing I am curious about, and you guys have kids. I remember when me and Dominic were kids, they wouldn't release certain movies for years at a time. So it was like after 20 years, they would finally release Fox in the Hound on VHS and stuff. Like, do they pull that crap anymore? Yes, or they do like, for the DVDs. Like... Yeah, they do. So like they'll oh, okay. take it out of the vault. They'll say like, it's going to go into the vault like Bugs Life, or, you know, or whatever. These... They actually do the vault for streaming. Wow. Too. They pull stuff. That, that's what I was going to ask. Wow. That's what I was going to ask is, is this new Disney streaming going to give you access to all that stuff that they used to make you wait for? N- Yes, I, I definitely think that they're, they're going to do that. I also definitely think that when you want to watch Infinity War, it's going to be on the Disney streaming service for the first year. So you have to sign up for that in order to watch it. And then it'll be released on other platforms. Oh, F you, Disney. <laughs> That's where you got him. You got him with that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to feel watch bad it. for stealing that one. <laughs> Let's go talk about this week's Miami Vice episode. There's no real easy tra- transition here, uh, but I will say this is episode six. We've had about five stinkers. <laughs> <laughs> there was like one or two of them in there that were okay. <laughs> this is the first one of this season that we've had that was actually like really good, like yeah. back to classic yes. 
of ice strong episode mm -hmm. so let's go talk about this week's yes. episode in god's work Okay, right, so when we open up, we're at the port. Tubbs, she's driving around in this caddy. The vice team is all stationed around. Sunny in the bug van, not Switex. Switex actually humping, lifting boxes and stuff. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, I thought you mean he was really humping. He was humping. <laughs> it it, it kind of opens like an episode of The Wire. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Of, They're like deep, like that. deep undercover, watching this yacht. You, this heavily armed. Also, is like is Sunny being punished? Is that why he's not with Tubbs? Is he because of last week? Is he like being punished for his? Mm, interesting. I mean, because he wasn't really in, in this episode for the investigation mm. part. Just, just saying, just putting it out there. Maybe they're actually punishing him for his shooting a kid. <laughs> yeah, actually, no one got killed in this. Very episode. true. Sorry, one person did, but not. You know, they didn't murder yeah. the entire family. <laughs> no, and, and it wasn't anything to do with vice. This might killed. have something to do with what John was talking about last week. Yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> the less we involve Crockett, the less people die. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I would throw that out there. Just an observation. <laughs> <laughs> well, the vice team is waiting for a man named Francesco. Mm -hmm. We're going to call him Frankie <laughs> in this episode. They're looking to make a move on him. They're setting up a deal where the Tubbs is going to undercover as Cooper is going to buy stolen goods. But the deal goes sideways really fast because Francesco sees a man in the yacht walking around. He thinks that Cooper set him up. But it turns out it's his brother, Felipe, who comes walking out and says, hey, come give your brother a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> And Tubbs very, seems to be pretty very relaxed about it. Strange family too. reunion starts happening, and I love, yeah, and I love that Tubbs is full time still trying to get him to say something incriminating. Like, <laughs> yeah, what like about this deal for the illegal products, man? <laughs> he just goes with it. He's like, okay, we put a lot of work on the in this. Come on, man, we just want to bust you. <laughs> and we go to the opening credits while looking at Francesco's surprised face as he sees Isa Morales playing a different character. <laughs> I'm not complaining. I like looking at Esai Morales. <laughs> this time after the opening credits, it's normally when we talk about uh, if we have an episode where there's a whole bunch of guest stars, like a whole bunch of big guest stars, we got to talk about them right up front. And this week, we're going to take a look at those guest stars. Well, what does a Mexican actor, a Polish actor, a Puerto Rican actor, and an Italian actor all have in common? Uh, They're all in this episode. Oh, I was going to guess they've all been in porn. <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole so, bunch of guest stars in this episode, but none of them are really big names, except for Isai Morales, I was going to say, excuse me, La Bamba, you ring a bell? <laughs> Everyone else was like, they were in movies and TV shows, but it was always guest appearances and, you know, secondary characters. So just, you know, they're accomplished. They're not, you know, Bruce Bruce accomplished. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's there's a big list of actors that are in this episode, but it's not. Someone did a voice in Coco. For some of these people, it's their second or third appearance as a different character in the show. And so maybe true. we already <laughs> talked about them previously. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct. Tubbs is talking to Gina and Zwitek. They actually heard back from, from the NYPD because they've been following the Cruz family, Francesco and their father, Jorge, Jorge for a long time. They have this big map on their wall, like a Godfather style, right? Like they got these brackets of pictures of everyone that's part oh, of the yeah. family. It's even more Godfather style because uh, they're talking about how one of the sons of the son, like left the family and went to, went to be like legit like a legit stockbroker and make all kinds of money. And so like now he's back. And so it's kind of like the Godfather where the son leaves, goes to the army and then comes back. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, it's a little bit strange that every picture is like a headshot. <laughs> like as an acting headshot that they take Look in. at the range on this family. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this one. This one he's being Italian. <laughs> this one's being a pirate. <laughs> it just looked like headshots. Like all their pictures are like, this is kind of weird. How do you get these pictures of them? <laughs> Tubbs is very worked up that Felipe's back in town, too. He says that Francesco is like, quote, Fred Flintstone to Felipe. I don't, I don't, I don't know, know what, what that, that means. means either. Uh, he really doesn't like, he does not like uh, Francesco. <laughs> <laughs> so now the vice what team. What does he really... like about Fred Flintstone? 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Insulted. I'm insulted for Fred. <laughs> now the Vice team thinks something's really up. Like Felipe's back in town. The entire family is back in town now. So something big must be happening. But Felipe is also the swinging bachelor from New York. He's like listed as one of the most eligible bachelors in New York City. And so Castillo says, let's also still investigate Jorge, but let's take a look and see what's happening with Felipe. Gina, you go check in on Felipe and find out what and he's up to. She's very excited about that. She's like, oh, and then even, <laughs> oh, yeah. me, even Crockett's like, ooh. <laughs> I, I, I like Zwitek. He gets stuck on a boat doing surveillance. They're just setting him up for disaster. You know, seasickness plus his inability to surveil. Plus his inability to do anything athletic. So I can't even see him floating on that thing. <laughs> you know, what's funny, too, is later in the episode, I'm pretty sure they swapped him with Crockett because you get that scene with Crockett where he's driving the boat in the circles. Yeah. His idea yeah. of surveillance. <laughs> Drawing him out. <laughs> We head over to the crew's house and Jorge, the dad, he's talking about all his kids. He says that Francesco was basically a dumbass and Felipe is his favorite. Like, yeah, I mean, that's pretty to. much what it goes down to. The mom, too. The mom's like, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, even Maria is like, yeah, I mean, Francesco's not exactly I have all a, there. I'd have a party for you every day if you were home more. Not for the other one, though. Look at him. Look at him. Be all I, couldn't over there. Concentrate. Uh, I couldn't concentrate on this scene because I just kept picturing the Godfather. You ask me to kill a man on this day, the day of my daughter's wedding sorry i was thinking more about the scene with the old man singing <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> inserts clip of italian man singing from godfather <laughs> <laughs> so this is, the, the cruises are italian right like we're, we're in agreement no <laughs> this is Actually, an Ita italian mob family everyone is happy to see that felipe's home except for francesco who gets drunk and throws his champagne in the pool after making a poor toast yeah he's an idiot <laughs> we head over to a church which you find out later that's a, a hospice and gina is following felipe over and there's a couple kids on the street who are like spray painting stuff on the church and saying that people can't go inside it felipe and gina and she's not taking any pictures I mean, she's so smooth, you can't even tell. <laughs> Don't even notice her, you know, standing five feet away, wearing bright pink, taking pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Felipe and Gina talk for a couple of minutes. Felipe goes and talks to another man while Gina secretly takes some pictures and sees on the paper that it's a hospice for people with AIDS. See, it pays to make appointments. <laughs> Meanwhile... Hubs is out getting chased by forklifts <laughs> at a warehouse. Jumping it's around. a killer forklift. <laughs> Hubs' worst say, nightmare. Everyone Tubbs knows he's got a fear, irrational fear of forklifts. <laughs> Dude, I love that on the much scene where he climbs on top of the <laughs> forklift and, and you see like it's clearly a stunt double riding around on top of there. Yeah, he's clearly much older <laughs> stunt double. <laughs> Tub senior again. He's uh, come back. <laughs> <laughs> I got tubs of stunt doubles like Morgan Freeman up there on top of the forklift. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, Tubbs does forklift driver at gunpoint, and then Francesco pops out. They, they excuse the forklift driver. <laughs> He's like, I'm leaving. <laughs> and Frankie and Cooper talk. Some way to treat your business partner. <laughs> Tubbs immediately calls him out too and says, like, Hey, I hear Felipe's back in town, so I don't need to talk to you anymore. Yeah, I'm doing business with him. Like, except he doesn't do business. So I don't know. <laughs> Francesco obviously hands handles that well. Yeah, no, no, he's not mad at he's all. He's not mad or jealous or anything. <laughs> oh yeah. T Tubbs just basically said that called him his, you know, brother's bitch, you know. I mean, of course he's gonna that's gonna go well. <laughs> So Tubbs leaves. He's like, oh, you know what? It's been a long day. I've been up to a bunch of stuff. I got chased by, by <laughs> possessed forklift. <laughs> forklift. I barely got away. You know what I want to do? I want to have a picnic with the boys. And so he meets up with Castillo <laughs> yeah, and Sonny yeah. and they're having a picnic out at the park. <laughs> totally, man. It's just just three guys in suits having a picnic at the park. <laughs> Nothing weird about that at all. Taking a stroll right by the water. I love the cat. Dude, the cameraman must have been so dizzy after that, too, because he's just going in circles. <laughs> <laughs> 
Tub says that the cruise family is losing pole to ducks, so they're not they're having troubles getting shipments in. Tub says that people aren't scared of them anymore, and that's why Felipe came back. That's that must be why he came back. But Castillo says Gina got a picture of Felipe meeting his uncle at the AIDS clinic, and also the clinic isn't very popular in the neighborhood because. Obviously, they treat people with AIDS. And there's like some other weird so, dynamic that's happening here. They don't know what to think of it. They don't know why he's there. They think that that he might be using the AIDS clinic as like some kind of secret drug drop or, you know, whatever. Something else is going on that he, he clearly, which this is what bugged me the whole time. Why can't he just be there because he cares about, cares about people with AIDS? Like, what? <laughs> yeah, like that was okay. what was bugging me too. Why do the people around there treat them like they're lepers? They're not. They're not contagious. Like, yeah, uh, exactly. You know. <laughs> but yeah, and that's the that's whole. The 80s, that's I a guess. big part of this episode, <laughs> yeah. right? Is that the AIDS scare in the eighties? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's multiple angles here, so we'll get to that at the end. Castillo says that Felipe and his uncle Ernesto, who's the priest at the church and who runs the hospice, were really close. But Ernesto was never a part of the business. He never wanted to do anything with it. He was never a part of it so but what might be happening is that for jorge that him being involved with aids patients might be hurting his business so let's go investigate that and sunny and tub try to say okay well we'll go and talk to him like no no no, you guys know your roles gina's got felipe covered don't go near the hospital just leave her alone and they don't want him he said he didn't want them talking to the priests specifically yeah he said don't talk to ernesto Mm -hmm. leave him alone he is on the straight and narrow, he's been like, he talked about how he had done some stuff in, in the past for... Um, he's my boy. Yeah, he didn't say that, <laughs> but yeah, that he had, he had protested a bunch of stuff, that he's on the up and up, basically. Which jumped to dad getting drunk with... St- <laughs> His bestie. <laughs> and apparently dad's pretty charitable when he's drunk. <laughs> he's so, that's the sad thing. He was so happy in that scene. Yeah, the Castillo <laughs> like, with a so big happy. old natural smile is really weird, actually. I know, it's like, what happened to your lips? <laughs> <laughs> They're gone. And I'm, I have a theory. So, but I'm going to wait. Let, let, let's get through him talking about how crappy the softball team is this year. <laughs> I'm just wondering the whole time, like, why do they know each other? Because they didn't really set this up. They just immediately jumped to Castillo yeah. getting drunk with Ernesto. And they're talking about softball and all this weird stuff. Like, it's just a weird conversation, too. The, the conversation, it doesn't mean anything to the episode other than that you see that Castillo and Ernesto are, are old friends. That's all you're supposed to know is that they're, they're close and that, you know, that he says, in the conversation that Castillo had helped him get hospital beds and I don't know if Castillo is like raising money or he get he's giving him his own money so he supports him and they're just friends that's like that's what you're supposed to get out of that that they're not gonna yeah, tell but how it's they just know weird that you don't know yeah you don't get any kind of stuff and it spurs off this whole side adventure Castillo goes on because he's running around while the vice squad's out doing popping up in all these different places uh, talking to priests after this, you know? Yeah, we just get like little snippets of what Castillo's up to, not the entire story, which I guess is the most Castillo thing ever. Yeah. Because you never gonna... know what the hell he's up to. You know that they po- they protested together. He said they st- they stood arm in arm, whatever, next week, shoulder to shoulder and protested together. I feel like I know Castillo more physically than I do emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> you know that mustache. No, I just... that whole speedo incident. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to wonder if he was ever in the seminary. Castillo, maybe he was uh, wanting to be a priest one day. Maybe, maybe that's where they all met. That could be actually. But he also says, like later on in the episode, that the priest liked before he became a priest, he liked women. <laughs> he also yeah, said that, just, that never I, changed. I think that, yep. <laughs> yeah, he said that never changed. That was, I was going to wait, but there's a picture later. Dad's sitting in his office and he's looking at a picture. And it, you don't get it, it's too quick to see Castillo in the picture. But I swear he's reminiscing about being in the seminary with them. Like, I, I want to, pretty sure they're all, they all have collars. <laughs> no, they don't. They don't. He's wearing like a regular shirt. I think what it's supposed to indicate is that before Ernesto became a priest, they were friends and they protested together. After they get all liquored up, man, Ernesto heads home. He's got a sweet ass home too. Some big shutters on the windows and stuff. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I thought the house was creepy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought we music. were getting a return of the meat fondler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the suspenseful music starts to pick up got a point of view camera shot someone coming into the house someone very nicely dressed nice shoes slacks comes up to the top of the stairs sees ornesto ornesto turns Doesn't they're gonna have put a shock he's to gonna him. put a horse head in his knee 
Yes, sorry. He has a shocked look, but not a scared look. He's just shocked that like he recognizes the person that's there. And he's surprised that it's them. Yeah, he actually smiles at first when he sees them. He's like, oh, and then it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like almost at first, like he was going to share his Cinnabon and then he realized <laughs> like what he was doing there. Yeah. A- and then the, the D bag shoots them before you can even enjoy the Cinnabon <laughs> and then doesn't even take it. A complete waste of a Cinnabon. <laughs> all those pastries in that bag and none of them got eaten. <laughs> the next day during the investigation, you see Castillo there. He's explaining to the uh, to Homicide that Ernesto's a great guy. He was never involved in any of the crew stuff. He's very trusting. So, of course, his door would be open. He'd be accepting anyone that would come into his house. But a nurse that works at the hospice saw someone named Ricky, who we'll meet later, run away from the house that night. They have some leads that they can follow up on, but Ernesto's dead. And also, they've murdered someone who's supposed to be someone good for the community. And now dad is taking this shit seriously. Yeah, he's not happy at all. I don't understand why he doesn't just tell them at that point then that he knows them. Why do you think he doesn't say like, hey, I kind of have a personal relationship with this man. (laughs) No, I'm not going to say anything. Because then he wouldn't be mysterious. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) (laughs) That's my question about this whole thing is why he didn't tell anyone else how close he was with with Ernesto. But. I guess Unless he thought that people would think that there's something like he should recuse himself, in which he should if he was that close. But I don't think that's it. I think um, he literally just doesn't want to open up. He's, it's just I think it's you're right. It's just the most Castillo way to handle it. If he did had come out and said in the open, then it wouldn't be him. He'd be somebody else. It'd be like Crockett. Yeah. I knew him. <laughs> Me, we were best I was going to say, maybe he just doesn't like everyone at Vice, just hates all their guts. <laughs> That's um, not it. So, or maybe he's just embarrassed at being an AIDS activist. Could be. That could be it, too. That maybe yeah. he didn't want that. To, maybe that part of it. He didn't want it to come to light that he had was involved in helping. Yeah, yeah that could be. He I was the one. He was the one that suggested the anti-AIDS activist be- a potential motive yeah he was really pushing on that 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 would be those people that didn't want him in the neighborhood well and this is what the vice team's doing at the precinct they're discussing all possible connections trudy found a match from one of the people that gina saw at the clinic from the nypd mugshots it's an old friend of felipe louis garcia who also knows someone named franco diaz so these families are all connected he's and- his son yeah, well, and right? Franco Diaz is Ricky Diaz's dad, who was there seen running away that night. So there's this weird family oh, okay, loop gotcha. that, that there could be. But they've had no contact uh, recently. And then Crockett spends 36 blabbing about stuff and pointing at stuff with the pointer, which I was just <laughs> thinking, how the hell did he get the pointer? Who gave him that? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you figured out he's the lead detective on everything? So that's why he's got the pointer? <laughs> Castillo wants Gina to continue her work at the clinic and Felipe and Castillo is going to continue to take this very personal. He's going to go off. He knows what he needs to do. He's going to go take care of some things. At the funeral, the whole crew's family is there and the protesters are there too because now the crew's family is mixed up in protecting AIDS patients. And at the time for the 80s, AIDS being linked to homosexuality. Yeah. Thinking that that it's like, quote unquote, the gay disease. So there was a huge stigma. Yeah, so yeah. there's these protesters at Ernesto's funeral because of his work with AIDS patients. Yeah, and how they didn't want it in their neighborhood. Gina catches Felipe at the bar after, and Felipe says that Ernesto was his hero. He was doing God's work. Bing. <laughs> Gina says she's concerned about her friends who won't be able to go to the clinic anymore. And Felipe says, I'm here to help. Get my car. Let's go over there. We'll make sure that the hospice is still going to be there. It's important to me. That my uncle's work doesn't disappear. I want to make sure that your friends have somewhere to go. Felipe is just a good guy. Yeah, more and more, it's just like he's a regular guy. <laughs> <laughs> and Gina just wants wants to spend some time with Felipe, some nice time alone. <laughs> yeah, she's not complaining. Dark room. <laughs> and meanwhile, at a different church, Cassio's talking <laughs> to a different priest. <laughs> he's like the head priest. That's yeah, he's like the archbishop, yeah. archdiocese, something like that. Yeah, of the area or something. Mm-hmm. I, I can sum this up pretty, pretty well. The head honcho priest pretty much tells dad to, to, to keep their name out, out his mouth throughout the investigation. <laughs> much, like, yeah. don't, don't throw shade over here. <laughs> keep it out of the media. Don't mention that it was in a tough neighborhood. Like, just keep it all out of there. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about the Cruz family and don't talk about the connection to the an- the people that were anti-gay. I mean, I guess, sorry, anti-AIDS, I guess would be the word. Gina and Felipe show up at the hospice and the same nurse who had seen Ricky Diaz the night before 
runs up and says that they got notice of AK in 24 hours and actually moving people out, like in hospital beds, out of the hospice. Just then, Ricky shows up and Gina asks the nurse if that was the same kid that she saw at Ernesto's house. She said yes, and Felipe takes off after Ricky. Ricky and his friends run. Now, hold on a second. I mentioned this last week. Felipe barely catches Ricky on the stairwell. They tackle something, they run up the stairwell. Gina's forced on the stairwell to pull her gun and show her badge because Ricky's friends pull a gun. Now everyone's surprised to find out that Gina's a cop. But that's what I was mentioning in the last week. Shame on the white men for not being able to catch criminals. And Gina and Trudy can do that shit wearing tight, short clothes and, and really tall heels. She yeah. ran them down yes. in her heels down the street. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and she not just that. But, yeah. yeah, and she had a standoff the stairs with four teens, one of them with a gun, another one with nunchucks. Did you see the nunchucks? <laughs> what are nunchucks going to do with, against a gun, though? <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, Gina, you know, she's, she's a badass. She, yeah, she took she all of them, they all backed off. Last week, Trudy was mowing people down, running in between barrels in her heels. Now, Gina ran someone down from 300 yards out in heels. Like, <laughs> just saying. She's like a police dog. <laughs> Meanwhile, Stan needs help chasing down the hot dog truck. Like, <laughs> he has had too many hot dogs, it is true. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the precinct, Tubbs is interrogating Ricky. He's trying to do his bad cop routine, but it's not working. And he says, well, fine, we'll just turn you over to the Cruz family. And then Ricky starts to pay attention. Like, what like, are you no, talking what? about? Huh? <laughs> like, well, they think you murdered Ernesto. Huh? And Ricky's like, well, I didn't. He's like, well, they do. And so good luck. It doesn't, matter. It doesn't matter if you did. <laughs> and we'll let them kill you because we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Haven't you ever worked with Vice before? <laughs> All we got to do is put you in witness protection and you're dead. <laughs> the end of the scene gets me because he goes, uh, he says that I saw a man in a suit and tie. And immediately dad calls and goes, we got to get Louie. <laughs> yeah, like, he just like, thinks that that's who it is right away. Is he the other one in the suit and the tie in this gang? Like, uh, how did he know? <laughs> yeah, John, I agree. I wrote it down too. Like, I wrote down out of the room. Castillo says it matches Louis Garcia. Makes call to have someone track him down. Dot, 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 question mark. <laughs> okay, but let's let's uh -huh. go a little further here. Let's go and know into what we already know. What maybe they, we, we need to talk about in the future. If he knows about the Cruz family, why doesn't he know who it is that did it then? Because he's seen him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm saying he knows who the Cruz family is. How come he's not right then? Like, hey, it's the dad. <laughs> <Poor him. laughs> Maybe because he didn't want to. He didn't want to be that person. He'd be I don't killed, know. right? That's a good question. Like, you he knows know. him. Yeah. <laughs> he's afraid of the Cruz Maybe family. Maybe Tubbs. Maybe Tubbs not that good at irrigating. <laughs> he can't. Hand, he can't like Gotta get specifics, buddy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is also when we see that Castillo's in his office. He's looking at that Bible, and in there has an article that the headline says "Marchers Attacked by Police Dogs," and he has it. He smiles in remembering <laughs> that, that police dog bit my ass. Fond <laughs> memories. <laughs> Back then, when he used to be a priest, yeah, exactly. Hung out with priests, and then there's a picture of him and Ernesto, and a man and a woman, yeah. all four together. Gina comes in. And Trudy says that there's no line on Louis Garcia. They don't know where he, is it, where he is. They can't find anything on him. Gina goes to leave, but stops. And then turns to Castillo and says, everything okay? And Castillo does the most Castillo thing. He stands up and says, yeah, get back to work. I know what I got to take care of. And he leaves. <laughs> She's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Get Weirdo. back to work, Tuts. <laughs> <laughs> Pats her on the ass. Bye. <laughs> So we get this next scene. It's an interesting standoff between a real estate company executive, I guess, and <laughs> and Castillo, where she's trying to make an argument that they're evicting the uh, AIDS patients, basically uh, with the argument of, well, what if we get the AIDS? <laughs> and Dad's response is, well, what if I investigate you and or arrest you? And then she finally caves and says, okay, it was the Cruz family that told that stop payment. No, no, that's not what happened. She said it was the church. It's nothing to do with the oh. church. What she said was, you want to know so something? So Catholics. Not yeah, she, the church revoked it, that they don't want to be a part of it anymore and that they were going to move it somewhere else. Gotcha. So that the, makes yeah, the next because, scene make <laughs> so much more sense. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yes. The church is who, is who did it. So then that's where Castillo goes over. The next scene is him going to go touch, talk to the head 
priest and saying, not like, talk why, to. <laughs> yeah, yell at. <laughs> He's going to blackmail. Yeah, this exactly. is yep. this is how far blackmail. we've gone with dad. Now <laughs> we're a blackmailing priests. He says, like, why did you pull the money from there? And, and he said that we never wanted it to be in that location. But Ernesto insisted on putting it there. We have these clinics all over the country and we're going to put it somewhere else. We're not. And we're not like basically closing our doors. We're just not going to leave it there. But he but then Castillo was like, well, what about the people that need it right now? And he's like, well, we're going to ha- they're going to have to wait, basically. And then, yes, that's when he, he starts telling him, well, then I wonder what it's going to be like when the media gets this. And then the priest is like, but we had an, a, an agreement. And he's like, well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Honestly, it really wasn't an agreement. It was more just the the uh, blonde haired priest telling him, like, hey, keep, my, keep don't say shit. Like there was no really <laughs> agreement there. Yeah, Castillo never said like, no, yeah, I'll keep it out of the no. So yeah, he did what he, he did what he was, he had to blackmail him. <laughs> so yeah. Did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Sonny's just out cruising his boat, having fun. <laughs> Dude, I'm saying, this is Crockett's <laughs> idea of boat surveillance. I'm going to drive really fast in circles until someone sees me and chases me. <laughs> well, he was trying to get him out of the house. Well, he was like. No, I think what it is is like he was pretending like why his boat had to stop right there. He was just out yeah, for a oh, cruise yeah. and then it breaks down and he lifts it up and he's yeah. watching binoculars. So I text sees Felipe leave, but Francesco's men are watching him too. So then they take off after him and then Sonny the leads them on a him. chase. Sonny's having so much fun on that chase too. Don Johnson knows how to drive a boat, okay? Let's just get this straight. That was not a stop double. To- <laughs> I, I want to point out that one, you don't need binoculars to fix a boat. Um, well, you know, <laughs> two, <laughs> two. You've never fixed and, a boat before. In, in a scene that I thought was supposed to be Sunny tailing the bad guy, turned into a Sunny t- chase montage. <laughs> and three, it ended in the most hilarious fashion <laughs> with. One of the Cruz brothers falling out of the boat and getting really wet, and then Crockett doing the most awesome thing and flipping around, coming back and honking and like I'm assuming flipping him off because that's the only thing that I could picture in my head. Yeah, and then then he's like the, the Cruz brothers like shaking his fist at him like I'll get you. First of all, like he didn't know who he is. So what what did he even do? <laughs> they see oh some random suspicious guy in a boat <laughs> and they go we're gonna chase him with our boat they chase this guy then he falls out and then he just crockett flips around and honks at him and eggs him on <laughs> I, I thought that was great and now we're back to classic vice because classic vice season one and two and a little bit in season three they do this and john po- pointed it out back then too where they do this they have something really funny happen right before something really serious is about yeah, to happen. Yeah, we're going to hit you right in the gut. And that's the exactly what happened. Daytime here. Emmy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Felipe has gone over and he's with Louis. Louis is clearly sick and he's dying. He's the one that's ha- that has AIDS. He's the reason why Felipe came back. They were childhood friends. And we find out in the scene that they were also in a relationship. At one time, yeah. At one point in time and then have since broken up. But they're still they're close friends. They've known each other for a long time. They've been family friends since, as Gina said earlier in the episode, since the sandbox. Yep, they've been because their dads were part like business partners. And Castillo, it's speaking of dad, Castillo's creepily <laughs> staying in the doorway. I know that was so creepy. Like I'm gonna watch this. Touching like moment. This, yeah, there's really touching moments going on in this room. There's Castillo kind of half in the doorway, just staring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was like trying to hide, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> this is a really powerful scene because it's it's multiple things, right? You see someone die, you see these AIDS patients who are being kicked out of this hospice because of the church mm-hmm. and because of some bigot that attacked the priest that was overseeing it. And now here's Louis dying in his friend's his best friend's arms. And then also that Vice tackled that he was gay. Mm-hmm. And that not only was Louis gay, but Felipe was gay too. Like the this mobster and macho that's, man, right? Which is where I'm torn on this episode because they had to make it vice. So they had to be like gangsters selling stolen goods mm-hmm. and this and that. And they couldn't make Felipe just a regular dude, but they did try their best. Mm-hmm. He's like part of the crew's family. They tried their best to make him just mm-hmm. a regular guy. But it's like, I also wish it wasn't about like the mob. It should have been just about, 
Well, I mean, mm. but they had to make it vice worthy. Right? There has to like be a vice. reason why vice is involved to begin with. I guess if they really wanted to, they could have just made it a Castillo episode and he could have gone off on like, like on a renegade thing. Like his friend gets killed. Then he goes off and investigates why he was killed and he finds out, you know, but, but then there wouldn't have been, there wouldn't be that sucker punch of this person dying and they had a relationship and he was gay and because there's nothing to connect that to vice. Mm-hmm. I kind of was on the opposite side is that, um, I thought I thought it was a really good out. I just wish there was a little bit more of the criminal el- element involved in it because I felt like we got uh, like at this point we gotten so far away from the actual uh, criminal investigation, focusing on like but with p- patients getting kicked out and stuff like that. That like in a couple of scenes we have that scene with Tubbs talking to Castillo and they're like we can go we can go get him now, right? A- and I literally wrote down like oh good we can finally get back to work. And the scene also ends in a very Castillo way, where then Castillo says, don't leave the city. And he just walks out of the room. <laughs> hey, sorry, I watched yeah. that touching moment, but don't leave, okay? <laughs> so just real fast, we have that scene at the precinct where Tubbs convinces Castillo, like, you know, it's Jorge that's behind this. Let's go bust him. So we head over to the cruise house in the final scene of the episode. It's a family meeting. Jorge and Francesco are saying, we're normal. We don't know, understand what's wrong I, with I, you, Jorge. I, I kind of imagine like this is how that show growing up Gotti must have been like. So this episode takes a turn I did not see coming. Jorge eventually comes out and tells Francesco, hey, Felipe's home. We got to embrace that he's here. We're a family. We'll get through this. I'm going to do what I can to get the gay out of him. Basically, yeah, that's yeah. what he says. Like, uh, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is oh, not- no. It's all Father Ernesto's fault for him being gay, you know, because it's those Catholic priests. Well, actually, he, the dad blames himself because he says he was never home. He worked too much. So that's why he's like, I, I kind of like he feels like almost like he feels sorry for his son. That it's his fault, so he takes the blame, and that's where Felipe is like, what are but you talking he, about? <laughs> but then he blames Father Ernesto, and that's why he killed him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He says that you being around Ernesto and him embracing your lifestyle, which is what Felipe is saying. Ernesto was one of my best friends and he embraced me for who I am. And and Jorge says, yeah, that's why I needed to die. He corrupted your brain by accepting your lifestyle. Meanwhile, Maria, who is Ernesto's sister, is listening to the whole thing from the hallway. When she finally hears enough, she comes out with a gun. Points the gun at Jorge. Right when she fires, the vice team come busting in. They lift up her gun. She has a non shot. She hit Jorge. And Castillo says, okay, now you're under arrest. And that's the end of the episode. So actually, But she vice shot was- the vase. Not the vase. <laughs> Did you see how nice that was? <laughs> and I'm going to talk more about this in my final thoughts, but all credit to Vice here. All credit for not taking the easy way out in having an episode where they have Felipe say, I'm gay because that's who I am. Not, I didn't turn gay. You can't unturn yep. me gay, which is all true. You just are. Yeah. That's the way that you are. I was born and this way. A, this is yeah, what I was. Exactly. Being 1987 in the peak of the AIDS epidemic and all these people's uh I mean it's obviously still going on today but everyone's uh, um like misconceptions yeah misconceptions about gay people and about AIDS so tackled this head on and ended it with yeah gay people are gay because that's who they are that's the way that they are and they're born that way they're not broken yeah that's what they, was, they were saying too like there's, not, there's nothing wrong with me you can't change me you can't fix me because there's nothing to fix it's just who I am exactly so as I was saying a very hard-hitting good episode of vice yes. and unfortunately sean they didn't end it the way you were hoping is that there was actually a criminal investigation <laughs> here <laughs> hey well there is a criminal investigation because someone got murdered it's just not their christmas <laughs> that lady homicide i'm like, just no confused, one ever told me anything but... <laughs> I, I'm I'm just confused by what they mean by full court press, uh, you know, on an investigation. You know, they had a lot of pictures and put a lot of work into that board for, for no real arrest there. Like, they didn't really take down the Cruz family. Well, I mean, they took down Jorge. <laughs> and his wife. <laughs> Francesco seems more than capable of running the business. He can't right? even get on, yeah. he can't even stay on a boat in a chase. How can he be run a business? He's the one that fell off and got all wet. Remember that toast he made? He couldn't even make a toast. <laughs> well, and that's the end of this episode. So let's go talk about this week in music because for the first time in a while, we have 
A clean slate. All new people. Let's go talk about this week's music. All right, y'all. And like I mentioned, people we have never heard from before in music. So this is exciting. We don't have you <laughs> two. We don't have David Bowie. <laughs> Get out of here with that. Phil Collins, go to hell. I don't mean it, Phil. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got for this this week okay so let's get started with yin and yang the flower pot and by loving rockets so i'm going to be brief with them uh only because they will return in the episode later on this season called love at first sight they are an english alternative rock band that mainly Sp uh, span from they were formed in 85 and they lasted until about 99 the members were uh, were david ash david j and kevin haskins and the name of the band actually comes from uh love and rockets the comic book series by the hernandez brothers they are actually made up of a couple different former bands but they went from uh kind of a gothic rock to a brighter, more pop-influenced sound. Their first major hit was actually a cover of a Motown classic called Ball of Confusion. Their biggest hit by far is uh, the T-Rex-inspired So Alive, which hit the number three on the Hot 100. And I think my favorite thing that they did, they did a project called The Bubble Men Are Coming under the alias The Bubble Men. <laughs> it sounds like... They were hoping that the bubble men were going to go further, but then they didn't. <laughs> yes. We'll talk more about them. Episode 10. So, but let's move on to Madagliani, Lost in Your Eyes by Book of Love. Which Book of Love? Like, why couldn't you just call it Lost in Your Eyes? <laughs> See that they're an American <laughs> synth pop band formed in 1983. Uh, they were formed in Philadelphia, but later based in New York. And what I mean by that is that they were led by the voc vocalist Susan Ottaviano with Ted Ottaviano on keyboard. No relation. <laughs> what? <laughs> you heard me right. Susan Ottaviano is not related to Ted Ottaviano, even though. <laughs> they went to the same high school, and their ancestors come from the same small Italian town. No relation. <laughs> yeah, someone's lying to them. <laughs> so, the rest of the band is made up of Lauren Rosselli and Jade Lee. And so the reason why I say, like, they were formed in Philly, but later based in New York, is because Susan and Tom met in high school, and then... Susan met Jade, the Philadelphia College of Art, and we're in a band together called Head Cheese. By the way, <laughs> all of the the previous band names in the music today are going to be excellent. So, <laughs> back to Head Cheese. That was uh, Susan and Jade's band. And then Tom and Lauren met in New York Art School. They decided to create a long-distance band with half the band being in Philly and the other half being in New York. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, as if that's not complicated. They started putting uh, stuff together and eventually Susan and Jade would move to New York and they would finally get their first exposure opening up for the Depe for Depeche Mode for their 1985 and their 1986 tours. And that actually became a common theme with them. The Book of Love pretty much throughout their span repeatedly would open up for Depeche Mode. Now them themselves, they would have seven singles land on the Billboard top dance list between 1985 and 93. So they did see some pretty good success themselves. Their most popular song and the reason they were probably used in this episode was their song Pretty Boys and Pretty Girls, which is was one of the first songs to actually openly address the AIDS epidemic. Uh, um, and it actually uh, uh, was their only hit landing in the Hot 100, peaking at number 90 in 1988. Um, their biggest hit was the song about the AIDS epidemic, so it makes sense they're in the episode. I'm surprised they didn't use that song, but maybe it was a little too on the nose. <laughs> a few other things. This song, Lost in Your Eyes, I'm not going to say the first part. <laughs> uh, was also featured in John Hughes's Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. 1991 song, Sunny Day, uh, 
was featured in the movie Silence of Lambs. And actually, in Silence of the Lambs, in the scene that they used the song, Lauren Groselli, who was in the band, actually made a cameo in the scene with Jodie Foster. Hey, I'm going to I'm gonna tell you guys something that's going to make you mad. Uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles was released on November 25th, 1987. It never reached number one in the box office. Running Man gave really? way to Three Men and a Baby. So wait, so Three Men and a Baby, Three Men and a Baby over Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Yeah. And then in between there, Throw Mama from the Train and Eddie Murphy Raw will both win weekends and be number one at the box office. And Planes, Trains, and Automobiles will never reach number one in the box office. And I remember when I looked up the song, John, I saw the still from Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. And I'm like, okay. And I went and look, looked up the movies. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some wrong people in the 80s. <laughs> at one point in time people were excited about a street fighter movie so i don't know maybe the <laughs> 90s weren't much better either hey you leave <sighs> john claude van damme alone <laughs> <laughs> so other song there's that were featured in movies the song enchanted was in 1993's naked in new york and the song i touch roses made it in the soundtrack for american psycho it, that movie american psycho is set in the 80s oh yeah it's set in the 80s yeah, like, what? Like <laughs> oh yeah six or something like that yep i hate that movie mm. sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> in 2013 they re reunite during a club date tours and would work on new material but ultimately band kind of faded out in the 90s and everyone kind of did different stuff Tom would spend most of the 90s working in music and making remixes for artists like Fleetwood Mac and Hole and David Byrne. Susan would actually attend the Culinary Institute of, Institute of America and the Institute of Culinary Education in New York and become a highly respected food stylist. Wait, um, that took so turn. like she's got peas. <laughs> yeah. that, took, that, that took a turn. You're like, okay, she, she'll sing you a song and cook you a great meal. You're like, food stylist. Like, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah what's a what, what's yeah. a food stylist <laughs> yeah tom's not sister distant cousin susan <laughs> um <laughs> became a food stylist she, she did all kinds of work with like food ads for like uh oh, okay craft and and all these people but she's also been has like all these recipes and articles in like parade magazine and all that all those cooking magazines i don't know any of them so <laughs> they're all owned by condé nast <laughs> yeah, they're all like cooking light, you know, whatever. Fancy cooking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, actually, she's kind of a big deal. Lauren Roselli, the one who had the uh, the guest appearance in uh, in Silence of the Lambs, she would actually continue acting. She would get married and, be, and take the name Lauren Johnson, and she would be in the movies Philadelphia, Beloved, and The Manchurian Candidate. So, Lots of work and with And not Denzel. to leave out. Yeah. Well, I think we'd all like to work with Denzel. Yes. <laughs> Yes, we would. <laughs> and not to leave Jade Lee out, Jade Lee would become a graphic design and artist. So now we get to Nine Million Rainy Days by Jesus and Mary Jane. <laughs> so they are a Scottish alt rock band formed in 1983. The band basically revolved around songwriting partners, Jim and William Reed, a relation. <laughs> What is going on? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. They are actually related. They are related. But yeah, basically, Jim and William Reed were the only constants in pretty much a fluid band where, like, they would constantly replace, like, bassists and drummers throughout. Like, even at one point during their touring that they just decided to replace the drummer with a drum machine for the entire tour. <laughs> We don't need you this one, Bill. We'll, we we bought a new drum machine. We'll just use that. <laughs> Scottish alternative rock band released their first single, Upside Down, in 1984 on the album Psycho Candy, which was actually critically acc acclaimed. And from there, from they would release five more albums until disbanding in 1999. Some of the original names that they had for the band before they eventually settled on Jesus and Mary Chain were the Poppy Seeds <laughs> and then Death of Joey. <laughs> I love the, their, their beginning. So like when they first started out, they started out playing in, small, in front of small audiences. And during early shows, which I love the author of the biography specifically wrote, typically amphetamine-fueled short gigs 
lasting about 20 minutes <laughs> with the band playing with their backs to the audience. <laughs> their early tours uh, started out with multiple incidents of violence at their shows. One in particular was a show they played with a band called Meat Whiplash. <laughs> where people started hucking bottles at them because of the short the short set and they showed up an hour late basically it because of their poor tour first like tour it left them with such a bad reputation and of their shows being you know riddled with violence that many uh uh promoters canceled shows in 85 and their defense about their sets being consistently shorter than 25 minutes was uh, their argu their whole argument was we only have about 20 minutes of material <laughs> it's everything we got <laughs> <laughs> that is the greatest excuse like that's all we got guys like i don't know what you want <laughs> i wish i was doing cover songs or some shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah quit throwing stuff at us <laughs> they would they would get more material and it would lead to less violent story <laughs> so things would settle down and they would uh, and tours would start to grow and then in 87 their reputation would take another hit after while being heckled all show by a group in the audience jim reed would eventually throw his mic stand at him <laughs> one guy in the head a uh, cut another one's arm he spent a <laughs> night in jail <laughs> and the charges were actually dropped after he apologized and donated 500 pounds to the salvation army <laughs> after years of fluid changes in the band reed brothers with the reed brothers being the only constant in 1999 things finally came to a head William would leave the band after falling out with guitarist Ben Lurie on the tour bus before a show. At that same show, Jim would appear very drunk on stage, barely be able to walk or stand, let alone sing. The band would re- uh, well, a promoter would refund the audience for their tickets, and they would finish the tour and call it quits. They still let them finish the so, tour? that's the crazy thing. So, after the band was over william would start a solo career under the name lazy came <laughs> jim would found the band free heat with ben laurie and neither project would see very much success. so in 2000s they would reunite form a few shows and we would get the traditional box sets and greatest hits and then <laughs> they all would 20 release, minutes long they actually released yeah i know all 20 <laughs> minutes of it. It, it it's in vine form <laughs> make put some new material together 2017 they released damage and joy first album since 1998 and then the few of the other things they have uh their songs just like honey was was featured in the movie Lost in Translation, as well with songs in Adventureland, The Crow, and Pet Cemetery 2. Um, and for you, Dominic, they are referenced in the Simpsons episode number 22, season 24, called Dangers of a Train, in which Reverend Lovejoy is reading a book called Jerry and uh, Jesus and Mary Train. <laughs> Listen, not it's not like if you get featured in The Simpsons, you've made it. It's more like The Simpsons is going to mention everything that's ever happened in human history, and or, The Simpsons or anything that could happen. Yeah, oh yeah, and The Simpsons will become your history class. You just watch every episode all the way through, and you'll learn everything that's ever happened in world history and what will happen in the coming 200 years. And with that, I'm fairly certain my music was longer than most of their original uh, <laughs> uh, sets. Longer than their set. <laughs> I'm still weirded out that there's two people that have the same last name and went to the same high school that and they know each other. So. <laughs> what? No. Yes. Oh, oh, and their ancestors trace back to the same small Italian town. <laughs> yeah. Not related at all. 
Not related. <laughs> what What do you think is the band band name though? Head cheese or uh, <laughs> wh- meat whiplash? <laughs> oh, meat whip meat whiplash is pretty good. <laughs> well, let's go break down this episode for the last time and our final thoughts. All right, I'll go first because I've I've already kind of said what I thought about this episode is that um. I thought it was really good. The storyline is really thought through. There's a couple plot holes, but really low for Vice. Like they covered it beginning to end. Yes, it was a little light on the crime side, like why Vice would be involved, but I'm going to skip all of that and ignore all of that because they took this straight on and were willing to say being gay is just who you are and you're born that way. And I don't care if you accept it or not. This is just the way that I am. And I really appreciate that about this episode of Vice. I really appreciate that this was 1987 and that they were talking about that. That's on national television in prime time that they were talking about that. So I'm willing to forgive everything else and just give all credit to this episode and the writers and the director of this episode that that they were willing to do that. But also, John, as you mentioned, significantly less people died in this episode and Sunny was kind of hard to find in this one too so i'm not ignoring that part <laughs> <laughs> melissa what are your final thoughts on this episode lay off a sunny <laughs> this is he's a really had good- a rough start to the season <laughs> yeah okay leave him alone already no. this is a really good episode i like this episode for many reasons but mostly like you said they they tackle a really touchy subject that in the in those days people still had some very bad misconceptions about AIDS and being gay and how you could only get it that way and and all these crazy things that we now know everyone knows now or should know are not true (laughs) and are dangerous thoughts so I think they took it head on and they did a good job it doesn't bother me that it's not that much of of an investigation because I get so much Castillo and I love Castillo I love Castillo backstories I love Castillo when he's emotional and he smiles and (laughs) and you're like what's wrong with your face (laughs) (laughs) When he's a a creepy lurker and he's like just watching from afar. (laughs) So I'm like, I have nothing to complain about. Like, it is kind of weird that I still think that they put uh, that Crockett's on like probation or something because he wasn't like like deep in this investigation. He was doing surveillance and he was working with Switek. And we all know that when you work with Switek, you've done something wrong. (laughs) So they got him on the back burner and Tubbs was doing his own deal. So I don't know what the deal with that is. But like I said, it's a good episode. (laughs) It's a sad episode. It makes me sad that scene where he where his best friend and former boyfriend is dying. And it's like, this is a really emotional thing. It's really sad. And I think Issa Morales was really good in it. Yeah, I thought he did a really good job. Great compared yeah. to what he was last time when he was <laughs> yeah, <I> <laughs> <just> <laughs> come along fantastically as an actor. Yes. <laughs> been practicing. <laughs> yeah, apparently. John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? So I think one, I think this has probably been the best episode of the season so far. Uh, and like you guys said, uh, you know, kudos to Vice for taking on such a, a big, heavy thing, you know, especially for, for the time that the episode was made. We're already kind of, we're all kind of on the same page with, it was a little bit light on the Vice cop show side, but it made up for it because it's always fun to learn more about Castillo's secret private life. A priest ninja. <laughs> so uh, I just think it was a really, really good episode. I think it proves my point that the, the more you keep Crockett away from the actual police stuff the less people <laughs> die the more things actually go the way they're supposed to go i think the only thing with the episode that i was left wondering was kind of closing out the getting the cruise family you know and arresting everybody i feel like we kind of got lost into uh, other motives by the end of the episode and then it was it wasn't about taking down a crime family anymore i also so. wonder too in that last scene if the vice team heard jorge admit that he killed Ernesto because if the Cruz family is the only ones that heard it then they're not going to rat him out they they'll try and they'll get him off and then Maria will try and murder him again <laughs> I'm pretty yeah. sure it was supposed to be insinuated that they heard everything but you know then they're just lurking Castillo's just lurking in the mm-hmm. hallway <laughs> like, waiting for it to uh, go down uh, before he jumps in he's very good at the at, at the just standing back in the hallway and staring all creepily <laughs> um, and I definitely want more Crockett in the boat getting people wet and honking at him. <laughs> that was great. 
That was Don Johnson and his element driving a yeah. boat. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoy this episode of Go With The Heat. I say it every week, but we would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com, twitter.com slash go with the heat, facebook.com slash go with the heat. You can find our website, go with the heat.com. If you didn't get <laughs> it, go with the heat. It's go with the heat. <laughs> you can go on that <laughs> website. You can click on support us. You can find all the ways to support. Support step number one go to your podcatcher platform of choice and give us a review. I'm going to ask, as always, to, for the highest review that you can give on that podcaster platform of choice. Some do stars, some do hearts, some do smileys, whatever it is. Just give us the five thumbs up or whatever the review status is. And then, but don't write a review. No one reads the reviews. Write about your favorite Isai Morales, either TV show or movie. Just just explain what your favorite thing is about Isai Morales. Tell us what you like better, head cheese or meat. <laughs> uh. <laughs> While you're on that website, check out the subscribe link. You can find all the ways to subscribe to the show. Recommend it to a friend. Shoot them a link. Maybe they'll watch it on YouTube. Maybe they'll listen to it on TuneIn. I don't know. Some people like to watch it on their TVs. I don't know. I'm not here to judge. It is weird. I'm not here to judge. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.